This Nature Reviews a Nephrology article says, risk factors include high sodium intake, low potassium intake, obesity, I would agree with that one, alcohol consumption, I would agree with that one, physical inactivity, probably agree with that one, unhealthy diet, I agree with that, but what I consider to be an unhealthy diet is probably different than the authors of this study. But they say that those risk factors may explain some of the regional heterogeneity in the hypertension prevalence. Nevertheless, the point that I am making here is that the burden of hypertension in this country and in the world are enormous. You know someone with hypertension. Before we get into what we are taught about hypertension in medical school, I want to share with you guys a distinction that is made in the medical literature regarding hypertension, which is the causes of hypertension, secondary versus primary. So when we think about hypertension, we are thinking of primarily primary hypertension something that Western medicine says is age-related. Western medicine teaches medical students that as people age, for every decade they age, the systolic blood pressure, which is the top number, diastolic number being the bottom number, the systolic number increases for every decade that people age. Is this true for all humans? I say no, and I'll show you data to corroborate that in one moment, looking at a hunter-gatherer tribe, specifically the Hadza, who I like to talk about. But Western medicine teaches us doctors, teaches medical students that hypertension happens as we age. This is primary hypertension. In medicine, we also wrestle with something called secondary hypertension. Secondary hypertension is different. I'm not really talking about secondary hypertension in this podcast, but many people do suffer with secondary hypertension. The numbers are much, much lower than primary hypertension, and the causes of secondary hypertension are things like kidney inflammation at the level of the glomerulus, the filtering apparatus, called acute glomerulonephritis, chronic renal disease, which is chronic kidney disease, polycystic kidney disease, renal artery stenosis, if the arteries that supply the kidneys or leave from the kidneys become stenotic, that is narrowed, that can cause hypertension. Inflammation in the arteries supplying the kidneys, renal vasculitis, can produce hypertension. Renin-producing tumors, which are going to activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis, something that I'll talk about later in this podcast, or aldosterone-producing tumors can also do this. So then there are endocrine causes of secondary hypertension, uh, adrenocortical hyperfunction, Cushing syndrome, primary aldosteronism, that is a tumor producing aldosterone, which is also part of the renin, renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, exogenous hormones, glucocorticoids or estrogens, birth control can definitely do this, pheochromocytoma, which is the tumor that everyone loves to think about in medical school, it's the, the prime zebra, um, but it's very rare, acromegaly, which is related to excess production of growth hormone, hypo or hyperthyroidism, these have to be very severe abnormalities in the thyroid, or pregnancy can also change blood pressure. Now, as I said, people with secondary causes of hypertension are much more rare than primary hypertension. The majority, I would say 97, 98% of what we see in medicine is primary hypertension, but I wanted to point out that secondary hypertension does occur, and there are causes for secondary hypertension that can be corrected if you remove the tumor or you correct the endocrine abnormalities. I remember one time when I was a PA, I worked in cardiology before I went back to medical school, I actually had a patient with severe hypertension and many doctors had tried to put him on multiple medications. He was on all kinds of things, minoxidil, second, third line medications for high blood pressure. And this was because no one could get his blood pressure under control. So I decided to check an aldosterone level on him and his aldosterone level was through the roof. He ended up having an aldosterone secreting tumor in his adrenal gland. So he had primary hyperaldosteronism caused by a tumor in his adrenal gland. And when that was removed, his blood pressure got significantly better. We later found out that he also had a prolactin secreting adenoma in his brain in his pituitary gland, so he probably had some derivative of a multiple endocrine neoplasia, another zebra thing that medical students like, but this gentleman's blood pressure was never gonna get better, no matter what we did, unless we removed the tumor that was secreting excess aldosterone into his blood. I'll talk about the aldosterone pathway within the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone cascade later in this podcast, but essentially aldosterone is a hormone that works on the kidney to conserve sodium and causes the excretion of potassium. Now, if your hormones are overacting and you're conserving tons of sodium, you will have hypertension, not because of excess sodium in the diet, but simply because you are increasing your absorption of sodium at the level of the kidney. So let's turn our attention back 
to primary hypertension. The rest of this podcast will be focused on primary hypertension because I think of primary hypertension, colloquial hypertension, as a chronic reversible illness with diet and lifestyle. Now, what does the Mayo Clinic say about primary hypertension? I'm showing you this to illustrate what mainstream Western medicine does for this condition. There is a top number of systolic pressure, a diastolic pressure. They talk about what is hypertension. Anything over 120 over 80 is really hypertension at this point. You should not have blood pressure of 120 over 80. And if you look at the Mayo Clinic, they do break this down into primary and secondary hypertension, or secondary hypertension have the having the potential causes that I mentioned earlier, though they do add obstructive sleep apnea, which I think is a good thing to be aware of. But risk factors for primary hypertension, according to the Mayo Clinic, include age. I'll comment on that in a moment. Race. There is some uh, predilection of certain races to develop hypertension earlier than it does in Caucasians, specifically African Americans, develop hypertension more severely and at an earlier age than Caucasians. Family history is a risk factor for high blood pressure. Again, uh, I am going to comment on that in a moment. Being overweight or obese. Yeah, I would agree with that. Not being physically active, probably, though I think that, as I've spoken about in the past, if you correct your diet and it is evolutionarily appropriate, you will want to be physically active because you will feel good. Tobacco can do it, yes. Too much salt in your diet. I disagree with this one. I don't think salt is a root cause of hypertension, though excess salt in the diet can worsen hypertension once you have it, but I'll talk about sodium, why I don't think removing salt corrects the root cause in hypertension later in this podcast. Too little potassium in your diet. Again, I doubt this is a root cause for many people, though in conditions that I will talk about later, specifically insulin resistance that are at the root of hypertension, there is a hormonal milieu that can lead to excess sodium and lower amounts of potassium in the diet. People always ask about potassium on a carnivore diet. Something I've spoken about in the past is that meat has a good amount of potassium, and it's not about how much potassium you get in your diet alone. It's also about how much potassium you retain. There's plenty of potassium in fruit. Anyone on an animal-based diet, which is what I am more a fan of, will be getting plenty of fruit and plenty of potassium in their diet. You don't need vegetables to get enough potassium, nor does excess potassium correct hypertension. You must correct the root cause. Mayo Clinic says drinking too much alcohol. Yes, that can do it. Stress can do it, but it's only temporary and the blood pressure should return to normal. Certain chronic conditions, they say kidney disease, diabetes, and sleep apnea. Those are really correctable conditions. Those are considered mostly secondary hypertensive conditions. So what about age and family history? To me, this is really a cop-out within Western medicine. This is the type of thing that we are taught in medical school. As I said, we are taught that as you age, for every decade that you age, blood pressure increases, systolic blood pressure specifically. And many people will say, I have a family history of high blood pressure. I was told by my doctor, there's nothing I can do. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. I believe both of those are cop-outs by Western medicine. In many people who have a history of high blood pressure, high blood pressure will develop, but this is not because of the family history. The family history is perhaps a predisposition that can manifest if these individuals are not living in an evolutionarily consistent way, but a family history of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, that is atherosclerosis, heart disease, dementia, stroke, cancers. These are not for sure in humans. These are simply predispositions that we have that are then manifest by the way that we live our lives. Western medicine fails to teach medical students this. And all too often, I have heard from patients in the past that there's nothing I can do about my high blood pressure because it's in my family history. There's nothing I can do about my high cholesterol. I have a family history or I have high cholesterol. I have high blood pressure because I'm getting older. No, no, no. You do not have high blood pressure or high cholesterol because you are getting older. You have high blood pressure and high cholesterol because you are living in an evolutionarily inconsistent way. And Western medicine fails to realize this. And Western medicine fails to counsel patients that this is actually a correctable, reversible condition. When patients go to their doctors and they are diagnosed with primary hypertension, 99% of the time, I believe they are told there is no cure for this. We don't know what causes it. There is nothing you can do about this. Take this medication. 1% of the time, perhaps, maybe 5% of the time if we're generous, physicians will say, cut down on certain foods in your diet. They will often recommend lower salt, but as I've mentioned, and I, as I will elaborate on later in this podcast, that doesn't correct the root cause and it causes more problems for many of these individuals. This paper 
should be shown to every single medical student across the United States, across the world. The title is The Physical Activity Patterns and Biomarkers of Cardiovascular Disease Risk in Hunter-Gatherers. Herman Ponser is one of the authors on this paper. He was on the podcast previously. And they say in the abstract, we found no evidence of risk factors for cardiovascular disease in this population of Hadza hunter-gatherers. There was a low prevalence of hypertension across the lifespan. Optimal levels for biomarkers of cardiovascular health. I've spoken about this paper in the past when I've illustrated the notion that hunter-gatherers do not get chronic illness. They do not have risk factors for cardiovascular disease as they age, as do people in the Western world. But the most important point I will make about this paper in this podcast is this graphic, which shows the systolic blood pressure in men and women and the diastolic blood pressure in men and women across the lifespan. You can see here that on the x-axis is age and years, and it goes up to 80 plus years old. Yes, hunter-gatherers live long, ripe, vital lives, and our notion that they die early is confounded by higher rates of infant mortality in wild human populations. And as you can see, the systolic blood pressure does not rise in any significant amount as they age. Even into their eighth decade of life, the average systolic blood pressure was only slightly above 120 millimeters of mercury for the Hadza hunter-gatherers. Diastolic blood pressure remains between 60 and 80 millimeters of mercury across the lifespan well into the eighth decade of life for these Hadza hunter-gatherers. There is no age-related increase in systolic or diastolic blood pressure in wild living humans. That is hunter-gatherers, the Hadza. I visited the Hadza in February of 2021. I spent time with them. I've spoken about my experiences there and their diets at length in the past on this podcast. In summary, animals are what they dream about. It is what they think about all the time. They are hunters. They celebrate meat and organs like nothing else. They don't give a shit about vegetables. <laughs> They really won't eat vegetables unless they're starving. They do not eat the baobab seeds unless they're starving. They will eat occasional tubers, but they get excited about honey and fruit. But even more so, they get excited about meat and organs. And they have no seed oils in their diet from their natural state. They are being influenced by local missionaries who provide them with cornmeal, unfortunately, and some seed oils. So trappings of Western civilization are creeping into their diets. But they are not a significant part of their diet, and I believe they were even less a part of their diet when Herman Ponser and his associates did this research on their systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So systolic and diastolic blood pressure do not rise with age in free-living wild human populations. This notion should be taught to all medical students, as should the notion that free-living humans do not suffer rates of diabetes, obesity, chronic age-related illness, cardiovascular disease, dementia, or cancer that are even a fraction of what we do in the West. Freedom from all of these things is completely possible if we align our diet and lifestyle with what our human body is expecting. That's the work that I do. That's how I frame all of the work I do.